right, so let's talk about the significance of Nagel's argument, right? We've already seen this argument that, you know, there's this what it is like experience that materialism just can't capture. Whether it's functionalism or another kind of materialism, you can know everything about the material stuff that makes something up and still not know what it is like to be that thing if it in fact has experience, right? Know everything you want to know about a dog, you don't know what COVID smells like for a dog. Know everything you want about an eagle, everything down to the molecules in his feathers and the molecules in his brain, and you don't know what it is like for that eagle to see ultraviolet, right? Well, why is this significant, right? You know, this is one of those philosophical things that messes with your head, right? What does COVID smell like to a dog? What does ultraviolet look like to an eagle? You just can't know, right? I mean, that kind of messes with your head. Well, but why is it important? Why should we care besides it's maybe cool and I don't know, whatever to think about? I mean, that's, that's a good enough reason for me at least, but why else should we care about it? Well, if Nagel's argument is right, then materialism, be it functionalism or some other flavor of materialism, right? You know, maybe our model isn't a computer, maybe our model is something else, but whatever our model is, whatever flavor we go with, it's going to miss something. And it arguably misses some of the most important things about the mind. Experience, you know, what it is like is not just this sort of, eh, who cares? I think Nagel would say it's really maybe the most important thing about the mind, or at least one of the most important. Well, why say that? Well, well think about this. What makes it wrong to hurt a person? It is wrong to go up and punch another person in the face in a way that it's not wrong to say punch you know, a dummy, you know, like if you had a crash test dummy, you just punched in the face. I don't know how hard the stuff they're made out of is that might not be a good idea, right? But it wouldn't be wrong to hit this thing in the face, right? If you have a punching bag, it's not wrong to hit your punching bag. It is wrong to hit a person in the face, right? Well, why is that? Well, because it hurts. There is something that it feels like for a person to get punched in the face. There is not anything that it feels like for a punching bag to get hit, right? Um, you know, I used to have this little, my favorite childhood toys was little R2-D2, like sort of punching bag thing. It was one of those wobbly things you hit it and it pops back up. I don't know why they did it for R2-D2, right? He was one of the more lovable characters. Nonetheless, I used to like, hitting this thing, right? It was fun. Pop, knock it over, it pops back up. Knock it over, it pops back up. Right? Why? Even as a kid, I know, well, own it, you know, there's not anything that it feels like to be this R2-D2 punching bag. It's okay to hit it, right? It is very much wrong to hit another person. It's wrong to hit your dog. Why? There's something it feels like for them to get hit, and it feels really bad, right? That might not be the whole story, but that's a lot of it, right? And we can tell that's a lot of it because it's not wrong to hit things that don't have experience, that don't feel like that, right? That is an important part of explaining our reaction to people and animals and the way we think it's okay to treat them. The fact that they have an experience that feels like something in a certain way. You know, but if a computer or robot could act like us, but it feels nothing, right? Would it be wrong to hit it? You know, I remember way back when I was an undergrad, I was at a party and somebody I knew had one of those creepy little Ibo dogs, right? You know, the, the artificial dog that Sony came out with. I thought the thing was profoundly creepy, right? I stayed away from Ibo. 
I kind of just wanted to throw it off the banister. You know, we were on the third floor. That would not be a good party thing to do. Throw somebody's expensive robot dog. But I just found the thing creepy, right? And look, if it were my robot dog, it might be a waste of money. It might be whatever. But if I wanted to smash it, if it actually were mine, wouldn't say I've abused an animal, right? There's nothing it's like to be an Ibo. If I hurt an actual dog, that would be terrible. There is something it's like to be an actual dog. You know, look, your computer, even if it can play chess super well, doesn't mean it's wrong to smash it up, right? It might be expensive. It might be stupid. It's not wrong in the way it would be to smash up Gary Kasparov, right? You know, if your computer feels nothing, it's not a person in the important sense it doesn't seem like, right? And it seems like we don't know, you know, if a computer could pass the Turing test, if it could fool us answering questions in the way a person would, well, that still doesn't tell us, does it feel like a person, right? Does it have the experiences we do? Um, it just, it, it seems mysterious, right? You know, and then should you care if your consciousness could be downloaded to a computer? Would that be survival? Well, if part of being you, of being a person at all, is experience... Well, if it acts like you, but it doesn't have the same experience, then why would you care? Or if it's a different experience, well, maybe you'd be uneasy, right? And even if the computer could act like a person, how would you know it had the same experience we do? There seems to be a fundamental problem here. You know, functionalism says, well, look, the internal stuff isn't what's important. Who cares? Let's just put it aside so we can do some fun science. And I think Nagel would say, well, this internal stuff, you know, the inside, you know, your internal mental space where you have these experiences, not only can materialism, functionalism not explain them, that's really the important stuff. And, you know, if you just don't talk about them, well... You're missing what's important. Your way of thinking about the mind misses an important thing, maybe the most important thing. And if Nagel's right, then a lot of what is important to us about the human mind can't be captured by current science. It's not just that we don't have an explanation. It's hard to see how one is possible. And if this is so, then cognitive science and similar approaches will miss something. And they'll miss something very important, right? You know, look, if we want to know what it is like to have a sort of experience that's unfamiliar to us, right? What is it like to be a refugee? What is it like to climb Mount Everest? You know. What is it like to win a medal at the Olympics? If you're a man, what is it like to be a woman? You know, if you're a member of the racial majority, what is it like to be a minority? You know, those seem important questions. And is any amount of brain scan, you know, knowing what goes on in the mind of someone when they win an Olympic medal, or when they have to flee their home country or whatever, or, you know, what goes on in women's brains. That, you know, if Nagel's right, and I think he is, none of those things are going to tell you what's important, what it's like to be these people, what it's like to have that experience. And if that's so, there's something that literature and art and movies and whatever might do a whole lot better job at than cognitive science or brain science or whatever. I think that's important. 
you know, how do we learn about the human mind in its important ways? Well, reading a really good novel or watching a good movie might still be a lot better way to learn about it than going through a bunch of stuff with brain scans. And, and, and I think this is important to know because it's actually, um, they've done a lot of studies and if you give people a really stupid argument or stupid explanation of behavior, we're very good at spotting that. But if you put in brain science or neuroscience says, people actually get way worse at spotting stupid arguments or stupid explanations of behavior. There are studies, the percentage of people who can spot that these explanations or theories are stupid and can explain how and why they're stupid drops precipitously when you throw in some mumbo jumbo about brain science. So I, I, I think, you know, this might be very good to be aware of when we think about how much respect we should give even good brain science when it's, you know, claiming to tell us what's important about being a human being and human experience. It should especially make us skeptical about, well, complete and utter nonsense when some claims about brain science are shoehorned into it, right? All right. So next lectures, I want to talk about L.A. Paul's work on transformative experience. She's written a whole book on this that's very good. Um, the what you can't expect when you're expecting is a kind of a manageable bit from her larger argument, but I think it's really good for introducing these larger themes. And she wants to take this idea that Nagel has, that we can't know what some unfamiliar experience is like. Um, there's another philosopher she talks about, um, who's also talked about this, but I mean, she's also working with Nagel too. And she wants to build on it in, I think, really interesting, and when you get down to it, disturbing ways. Unsettling ways, maybe you might say. So anyway... That's where we'll pick up in the next few lectures.